Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Well, you finally made it. I've been waiting here a while now just for you to show up. And I have to tell you, I'm very thankful for your listening air. In this episode, I'm going to talk about something that is most relevant to virtually everyone. I don't know anyone that doesn't do this at some point or another, even me. (laughs) Yes, even me. No, and that is taking things too serious. I often try and lean or move on the side of the jovial, the fun, the adventure. But every now and then I get caught up in the in the gravity of things, the seriousness of the issue, the, the importance of what's going on. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. But before I do, I want to relay a little conversation that I had with my son. We were on a little road trip about a month ago. Nothing was playing on the radio. And I asked if I could play my podcast. Now, I was secretly hoping he would listen to it. And I I said that I had just posted it, and I wanted to hear how it sounded. And it played. It was only a five-minute Friday, which is probably 12, 15 minutes. (laughs) But uh, I asked him what he thought of it at the end. And he said, oh, um, I wasn't listening. I said, not at all? He said, no, I was reading my phone. (laughs) I said, have you ever listened to it? Uh, He said, no. And then trying to make up for it, he asked me, how's your podcast doing? And I said, actually, it's doing really well, much better than I thought it would. You know, it always could do better, it could do worse, but I'm very happy with the results. We, In fact, at the time, I said, we just passed 50,000 downloads, which for my first year, I think is pretty darn good. And the most important part, though, is I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And then he thought for a moment, kind of wistfully asked, If I had any episodes on not taking things so seriously. Now, he's 21. He's a videographer, a budding filmmaker. Whoops, my mistake. He's not 21. He's 23. He would not be happy with me making him much younger. I wouldn't mind myself, but I had to set it straight for him. And he gets caught up in taking his projects and taking his work too serious. And even conversations, anticipating (laughs) conversations, you know. And I said, well, you know, I'm not sure. I only have about 120 episodes, and I can't remember (laughs) each and everything that I've done. So if I broached this topic before, but I know I haven't broached it in this particular way. It might have been something around how much fun are you having. Uh, But this is going to talk about more the insidious nature of taking things too seriously. I'm going to talk about how it affects the mind. I'm also going to address how it affects the body. I'm going to talk about it, how it plays into law of attraction and attracting in the things you want. And also around self-identity, self-image. So as you listen to this, identify where this is affecting you. How are you being too serious in your life? So first of all, let's ask, is there any virtue to taking things seriously? And many of you will probably agree that those times when you take things seriously, that it is a virtue. So if you think about the physicality of taking things seriously, usually the, the, the vision narrows and there's a little crease in the forehead as you like bear down on you know, the task at hand and you take it seriously. By God, you shouldn't have any fun because it's too important to have fun. The other physical attributes of when we're in the serious mode is that our, our ten, there's tension in our neck, in our shoulders, and our breathing tends to be shallow in nature. This, by and large, is the stress response. It is the response we typically have to a threat. Now, let's look at the motivation to take things seriously. It's typically because we consider it too important to screw up. You see, it's implied that if we're not careful... We are going to screw this up and probably screw it up royally. And that could be your life. Some people are just serious by nature. I don't know why they feel like they're, you know, expressing joy, laughter, smiles is irresponsible and probably trivial. 
But if we consider the biochemistry that is associated with this physiology, meaning how we're holding our body, how we're breathing, our facial muscles, if it is not an acute stress response, it is more than likely a low-grade chronic response, which basically could be associated with like an IV drip of stress chemicals into your bloodstream all the time. Now, I don't have the time right now to dive deep into the effects of the body on stress, but it does make you dumber. In fact, it drops your IQ by about 30%. Studies at Harvard University show that the, the stress response, anxiety, and complaining, negative thinking, actually reduces your IQ by about 30 points. Contrastly, when you're in joy, feeling good, satisfied, fulfilled, your IQ goes up, meaning that you have resources that you don't have access to in the stress response or the serious look. So let's say you find yourself being too serious from time to time, or maybe you're like my son, you take yourself too seriously most of the time. So how do you counteract that? Now, my simple response is to chill out, relax, take it easy, have fun with it. Look at the bright side of things, accentuate the positive. You know, to every cloud, there's a silver lining. And let's say everything goes wrong. What's the worst that can happen? And entertaining that last thought process is the thing that makes seriousness seem like a virtue. Because, again, it's so important that we should take it serious. And the, the downside of it is, you know, pretty steep or could be steep. But most often when people get caught up on a regular basis of being too serious about life, too serious about their projects, too serious about how they're being seen, it's that they don't want to be perceived as less than. If they turn in work that is less than perfect, if they show up with a sense of fun, they could be perceived, you could be perceived as being trivial, not up to par, less than capable, not responsible. But frankly, if you knew yourself to be okay, if you knew yourself to be responsible, capable, then whatever anybody else thought about that wouldn't even matter to you. See, it only matters because secretly, inside, you feel as if you're not responsible enough. Inside, you feel like you're less than perfect, that you could be perceived as not capable. And so you put on the mask of seriousness in order to avoid having that proven to the world because then it would confirm your worst fears. Sometimes people take seriousness to the point where they actually induce depression in themselves. There's almost a sense of futility as they look at the circumstances and the events in their life that seemingly they have no control over. And if they project out in the future, there's a sense of futility about who they are and what's possible for their life. That's a dark place to be. It's the idea that this hole that I'm in, the, the one that I've dug for myself possibly, or that I, I find myself in, is so deep, so dark, that I cannot see any way, anyhow, I'm going to get out of this. There's a sense of futility and a stuckness. And uh, I've only been there for a couple weeks back when I was in my 20s, but it was uncomfortable. But I do recognize it as a very human response to circumstances. For some reason or another, I have always, for the most part, seen that what's possible, seen that I can find the, the light at the end of the tunnel, no matter how dark it is where I am, because I'm always kind of projecting to the possibility that lies ahead. Maybe that's what was ingrained in me when I was 13, when I encountered that quote, the ceiling to your potential is determined by when you say, I can't. So there's always been this sense of autonomy, this sense of uh, authoring, self-authoring within me. And so even when I was in that state of depression, what, that sense of futility for that couple of weeks, I found my way out of it. But I have to say, I didn't get out of it on my own. I was guided. And if I look back on it, I was guided by a number of situations, a number of people and uh, you know, the Olympics were going on at that very time. I was watching the Olympics on my little 13-inch color TV, which is smaller than a lot of computer monitors, but that's all I had. 
I was inspired. I was inspired by the training. I was inspired by Mary Lou Decker and Carl Lewis and, and Greg Luganis. And who can forget Flojo? You see, these athletes, they showed biographies of them training and what they wanted to create and what it took for them to get there. And here I am sleeping, laying in my bed, feeling sorry for myself because I'm frustrated with, war with the situation that I created. And as I describe this, I realize this probably needs a greater explanation, but I'll do that in another podcast somewhere along the line here. But, you know, I, I've been in that dark place, and some people live there, and their family situation, their relationship situation, it, it can be dark. I'm here to tell you that there is light at the end of the tunnel. If you train your mind, focus your mind in a different spot, you can find your way out. This is not forever. So even though this seems serious, it's not that serious. It's important, but it's not serious. You can find your way out. You can work your way through it. Change your thinking. Change your life. And in a moment, I'm going to talk about the thoughts or the thought process that will assist you in getting out of it. But first, let's talk about how this affects the law of attraction and drawing and attracting things to us. Sometimes people get serious about their manifesting process. They'll read their affirmation or their intention three, four, or five times a day because they want to make sure that the universe hears it. Technically, you only really have to do it once with full emotion. But because we fear that it's not being heard, we fear we're not doing it right, we get serious about it. And when we get serious about it, we imply that the failure behind it, there's doubt that it's working. Because why else would you be serious about it? Well, something just popped in my head. Well, whatever you're trying to manifest, you feel like you need it. You want it. You don't have it. And you really experience the lack of it. Well, that is not the way to attract something into your life. When you focus on the lack, you create more of the lack. When you doubt the process, you interfere with receiving. You're not open to receiving and allowing. That serious attitude actually gets in the way of you attracting, manifesting what you want. It's like throwing up a big roadblock saying, I don't trust the process. I think I have to do this on my own or put a lot of effort and struggle into it. I'm not open to receiving this easily. And also, there's this feeling like I cannot fail at this. I need it. I want it. I have to have it. So that we're thinking about the failure aspect. It You look at what you're picturing in your mind. What's the intention you're actually drawing to you? It's that I'm not going to do it. I'm going to fail. This isn't going to work. I can't afford for it not to work. So I'm going to double down and make sure that it gets out in the universe. Well, that's not the way it works, like I said. So what do you do with it? Well, you have fun with it. You make it an adventure. You make it a game. But, but, but doesn't that make it like a trivial attitude, like irresponsible? No. In fact, my motto is that if anything is important, it's worth having fun doing it. If it's, if it requires seriousness, it requires serious fun. And like I said earlier, according to Harvard, the more fun we can have, the more adventure we put into it, the smarter we are, the more resourceful we are. And when we look at the physiology, when we're embracing fun and adventure, we bring in joy, fulfillment, satisfaction. That biochemistry that's associated with those emotions are dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins. Speaking of endorphins, I don't know if you know this, but I think this is pretty cool. Endorphins is actually a collection, a collective name of about 30 different neuropeptides that impact our nervous system in a very positive way. It elevates our mood, it elevates our, our feelings of well-being, our spiritual connection to the world. It enhances just about everything. Think about your most amazing orgasm if you've been involved in sex. That, my friend, is a boatload of endorphins. So just how powerful are endorphins? Well, they attach to the same neuroreceptors as morphine, opium, heroin. Yet, ounce for ounce, they are 200 times more powerful than those external drugs. This is produced in your body. This is available to you when you focus your mind. And when they're not present, when your dopamine is not present, you tend to feel depressed. 
When you're not engaging in charitable acts, gratitude, joy, serotonin falls off. When you don't have physical touch, when you're not engaged physically in life, oxytocin goes away and you don't feel so hot. You don't feel very chipper. You see, it's all a matter of biochemistry and the biochemistry is a reflection of your thought process and how you move your body. So what's the thought process that will get me out of this seriousness? Like I said earlier, it's typically the thought process is what can go wrong? What's the worst case scenario? So the opposite of that would be, what if everything went right? What if this went through the roof? What if this was so amazing, so fantastic? Wouldn't that be something? This is focusing on the possibility. This is focusing on the positive aspects of life. But what if you're mired in this, this depressive feeling, this, this sense of seriousness and, and hopelessness? How do you work your way out of it? My first suggestion is to do something that is completely antithetical, completely different, that is not in alignment with feeling hopeless, a sense of futility, depression. Do something that is not characteristic of those mood states. And that might be standing up, clapping your hands, smiling, yelling yes, and woohoo, only with much more enthusiasm. I didn't want to blow the mic out. So what else could you do? You could uh, run around the room, run up and down the stairs, you know, drop and give me five push-ups. You could dance a jig, start singing a song. And this is the thing. Do it even if you don't feel like doing it. Go through the motions. You see, William James, the father of American psychology, said that the fastest way to shift your emotions is to move your body. There's something intrinsically going on inside when you start moving your body. And this is the animal responding to circumstance. That if you start moving your body, even if you don't feel like it, after about five minutes, your brain makes a switch. It basically says, this idiot is not going to sit down. You're not going to lay down on the couch anymore. We need to rally the troops, inject the biochemistry in order to support this idiot's movement. Because I say idiot because when you're in that state of hopelessness and depression, you don't feel much like doing anything. It is hard to get up and go in the other room or even to get up and go to the bathroom. So don't expect yourself to go from zero to 70 in an instant. Understand that it's going to be an incremental process. So after you do a pattern interrupt, you interrupt this pattern of behavior. Once you do that and interrupt it, you have a window of opportunity. Start focusing your mind on things you can be thankful for. And you might say, if I'm in this state, if I see the world as being hopeless, if I'm too serious about this, if I think I'm going to screw up, what do I have to be thankful for? Well, pick low-hanging fruit. And I often tell people, lower your standard for feeling happy. Now, when I say that to people, a lot of people balk at that. Why would I lower my standards for happiness? Well, you want to make things easy for you. So what might be some low-hanging fruit, some lower echelon uh, activities that I could embrace and be thankful for. Well, this morning, I got up out of bed, and I got up out of bed unassisted, all by myself, and I walked to the bathroom without getting lost. I think that's pretty amazing. I think that's something to be thankful for, don't you think? In addition to that, I actually made it to the bathroom. I didn't have an accident in the bed. I was able to get dressed and get myself downstairs in the dark without any assistance. You know, I'm over 60, and I can still run down the stairs like I did when I was 20 years old. Now, running up the stairs is a different story. I run up the stairs like a 40-year-old. Now, you might be saying that all that physical activity isn't that special, but you have to understand that just over 60, and I, I hate to keep bringing up my age, but I have to put some relevance to this, at this stage of my life, I've had as, at least a dozen people that I went to high school with. They're no longer on the planet. They left. They died. And I feel fortunate that I still have my health, that I still am very healthy comparatively. And this is a point of relevance. You see, when you have your health, when health isn't really a concern, you have a thousand dreams. But when your health is in jeopardy, 
you only have one dream, and that's to regain your health. So if you're early on in life and health isn't really a concern, take care of it. So what else could I be joyful for? I'm joyful for a cup of coffee. It's an amazing thing in the morning. It helps jumpstart the day. I love sitting with it, not only drinking it, but I, I love just wrapping my hands around the warm mug. I love that sensual feeling, the, how the warmth radiates in my hands. Now, I did that this morning out by the pool as the sun rose up above the horizon. It went from dark, and that, that the first light in the morning, it's such a magical time, the golden light. And see, I'm, I'm being very romantic about it, and I'm embellishing it. You know, I think I need to do an episode on romance of life. But I get to say, I, I accentuate the positive. I appreciate it from, a, from a, an investment point of view. I'm raising the value of some commodity. I'm getting the value of it in my life. And when you're present to the value in your life and you feel blessed in these seemingly small and insignificant ways, you have the experience of being blessed in your life. So you ask me, am I saying that all I have to do is focus on things to be grateful for? Well, that's a great beginning. There is no greater tool at your disposal than to be connected to gratitude. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but I'll bring it to your attention. All those things I mentioned, I was present to in the moment. It had nothing to do with what was going to happen tomorrow. Nothing to do with what happened in the past. It was centered in what was going on right now. You see, the present moment is your point of power. In this moment, you can choose your response to life. It is your ultimate freedom. Something my son does when he catches himself feeling too significant, too serious, is he'll say it out loud, today is going to be a great day. And I'm trying to get him to say, today is going to be phenomenal. Today is going to be amazing, marvelously fantastic, like over the top. Because over the top calls up so many more emotions, so many more biochemicals to support that enthusiastic expression. But he says, today is going to be a good day, and it's something for him to look forward to. In fact, he said that just a couple days ago before he left for Austin. He's down there on a film project, and he just reported back he's having an amazing time. Now, he's doing the camera work for a music video for some country star, but my wife thinks, based on the enthusiasm of his report, there's a possible possibility that there's a love connection for him somewhere in the mix because they're all done with principal shooting and he's hanging over for another day to hang out and have fun. And I only mention that because obviously he followed his own advice. He kept the, the focus on having fun, having a great time, making it a good time. Now, I, I do feel like I need to bring up a counterpoint because I watched this video this morning uh, by Jordan Peterson, and I love Jordan Peterson, but he talked all about how life is suffering. And this is something the Buddhist says, too. The Buddhists say it, as a matter of fact, that life is suffering. But I have to say for myself, that has not been my experience. I mean, I haven't had a rosy path all my life. M most of my life hasn't been that, that smooth sailing. But... I've never felt like I was suffered. I never felt like I was in the midst of suffering. Because I also got that the Buddhist said that, this, that the source of all our suffering is in our attachments. And so I decided not to be attached to the outcome. Like, whatever happens, happens. And in that acceptance, there's a great deal of peace. If the milk gets spilled, don't cry over it. Pour yourself another glass. If you fall down, pick yourself back up. If you skin your knee when you fall down, put a little Bactine on it, put a Band-Aid on it, get up and start running again. It is what it is. And while sometimes disappointment is there because you wanted it to turn out some other way than the way it did, I'm not attached to it. Once I acknowledge the disappointment, I can release it and move on. I ask myself the question, what's next? What's possible? What does this now make available? You see, I've talked about all this before, just not necessarily in this context. And as I said on the front end of this, 
being too serious about life has this insidious nature to it that you're not present to on the front end. It's like this subtext that weaves through and really makes things uncomfortable for yourself. It prevents you from having joy. So I come at life with the attitude of the grand adventure, an exciting aspect of life. Would you want to be anything other than a human being? This is how we can tie it to the spiritual aspect of this whole journey. The Christian mystic Teilhard de Chardin said that we are a spiritual being having a human experience. I like to say that we are a spiritual being immersed in the human experience. Like, we're, it's all around us. And we have an aspect to us that is animal. That's our body. And if we acquiesce to the responses of the body to life, to the 3D world, the material world, then, yeah, I guess you could say that life is suffering. But when you elevate your mind, when you focus on the positive, when you elevate your spirit, when you come from a spiritual perspective, it really is just a play of consciousness. And I think this is easier to understand if at some point in your life you've had what is considered a transpersonal experience, where you've either left your body or had a mystical experience, you had a near-death experience, and you have direct empirical evidence, personal evidence, that you are more than your body, that this really is a play of consciousness. This is just a stage. Life is an illusion. And you hear people say that a lot, but I think a lot of people say it and they have no idea what it really means. Because I've talked about before where I've left my body, left four times and flew across the universe. And I probably the thing that I came away with most relevant from that experience is that I am more than my body. This life, it's fun. I'm immersed in it. But it's not all there is. There's so much more. This is just a play. This is, you know, a blip on the timeline. And so if you have a choice to be serious about it or to have fun with it, I vote have fun with it. Make an adventure. And that's why at the end of every podcast, I talk about engaging in the epic adventure. This is your life. I'm trying to cajole you into realizing that your life is a, a grand majestic thing to be involved with. You have all this opportunity to create your life as you want, exactly how you want. And the thing that stops you is when you get too serious about it. And if taking things too seriously has been a habitual pattern for you, you may have to interrupt that pattern again and again. Each time you do it, you can address it, acknowledge it. That's my old story. My new story is that life is meant to be fun. Life is meant to be enjoyed. In fact, when I'm immersed in joy, when I'm immersed in satisfaction, when I choose to be happy, then life unfolds like magic. Well, until next time, this is your friend and host, Daniel Danovi, urging you to follow your bliss. By all means, have as much fun as you can possibly stand as you live from inner signals. Be inner-directed as you engage in the epic adventure. <laughs> <laughs>